This morning we're continuing our series on worship and we're right here at the end of it almost. I say almost because I don't know if God's going to lead me into one more sermon next week on worship or whether we're going to shift gears. So you can you can look at this message this morning as the conclusion maybe. It might be, okay? But it doesn't matter whether it's the last one or not. The idea here is that we want to look at the keys to experiencing God in worship. Now, this may not be a comprehensive list, obviously, but it is. there are certain keys, there are certain things that we can bring into worship, that we can expect in worship, that really bring us into having an encounter with God. And I don't know why you came here this morning, but I'm here because I want an encounter with the living God who I love and who died for me. Amen? Our message today begins with 70 followers of Jesus in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10. Actually, we must consider the end of chapter 9 if we're going to understand the context of chapter 10. Look with me, if you will, in Luke chapter 9, 
beginning in verse 57. It's a great cost of following Jesus that is listed here. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus replied, The foxes have dens and the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And he, that is Jesus, looked at another man and said, Follow me. But he replied, Lord, first let me go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. And still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. And Jesus said to him, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. Well, with this passage in mind, in Luke chapter 10, verse 1, we see devoted followers of Jesus. Now, we could spend an entire hour talking about chapter 9 and what we just read. There's a lot of interesting material that we could share there. But it is just the prelude of where we're going in chapter 10. And so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on those passages. Look at verse 1 in chapter 10. After this, in other words, after what just transpired in chapter 9, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him into every town and every place where he was about to go. I've always been intrigued by this unnamed number of 70 folks, 70 followers of Jesus. In many ways, they represent a perfect picture of a faith-filled worship in response to God's revelation in their life. I want to say that again. In many ways, they represent a picture or a snapshot of faith-filled worship in response to God's revelation of who he is to them. As they had to do so, and they had to go in places that Jesus sent them, and they followed his explicit directions uh, and instructions in the process to proclaim that the kingdom of God was near. You're going to find the term, the kingdom of God versus the kingdom of heaven, in two different gospels. One writer says it one way, one says it another. But I want you to understand whether it's the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven, it is synonymous. They are the same thing. So don't let the terms mix you up. They're talking about the same thing. In the process... Um, we see that uh, they followed God, uh, Jesus' instructions to go and tell people that the kingdom of God is near and to put their faith into action in order to see God's intervention in their lives, in many lives. In the process, these 70, might I say, ordinary people, raise your hand if you are an ordinary people. Oh, wow, look at here, we got... We got almost 70 here, ordinary peoples. We could do what they're doing. But he says in this process, these ordinary people, just like you and me, experience God in amazing ways. In Luke chapter 10, verse 17, if you want to look there, it says, The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. What name? The name of Jesus. We just sang about that name. Great is the name of Jesus. Powerful is the name of Jesus. All authority and power on heaven and earth is given to him, Jesus. Verse 18 says, he replied, this is what Jesus says to him now, after they come back, they've done what he said. They went into these towns and told everybody that the kingdom of God is near. He's coming. They, they are kind of the, the harkers or the, the heralders as they go into these communities and they say, look, Jesus is coming. The kingdom of God is coming near to you today. And they come back and they're all excited. And listen, they must have had some interesting encounters on that little escapade, that little trip where Jesus sent them because they come back and they said, wow, Jesus, even the demons are subject to us by your name, by the authority of your name. And what he say to them? I want you to look. Jesus says, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, 
Oh, there's a however in there. You, you see all this wonderful statement Jesus just made, and then we got this however. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Amen? Rejoice that, that you have a place of eternal life with Jesus, with God the Father. Rejoice in that. Don't get caught up in the idea that you're somebody or that how excited you are because you can cast out demons by the authority of the name of Jesus. Don't get excited that, that uh, the spirits and the demons and, and the different circumstances are subject to you because of the power of the name of Jesus, but be, be happy and rejoice that you have a place with the Father. Amen? We do ministry. We do lots of different things. Helping people, trying to reach out to people. And you know, sometimes we experience opposition. We have experienced that many times in this church. Uh, we had one time there was a business, uh, an inappropriate business, I might add, uh, to be in the vicinity of a church for sure, that wanted to put a business across the street from us. And what did we do? We went to God. We went to Jesus. We went to our Heavenly Father. And in His name, by His authority, we said, that's not happening. This does not bring glory to God. We know it's not God's will for this to be put here. And so we proclaimed the glory of God, the truth that Jesus tells us. We have authority in that name to move mountains, if you will. God tells us a lot about that in other places in Scripture, which we don't have time to visit this morning. But, you know, we could speak volumes about these verses right here. But the question we need to ask, or answer, I should say, is what do these have to do with worship? Yeah, isn't that what we're talking about? You know, I started out keys to worship, and now here we are traipsing off into villages with these 70 who evidently are casting out demons because they're subject, the demons are subject to them. Obviously, obviously, it's an indirect way that they do. So let's look at four keys to experiencing God in your worship of Him. Worship, we need to keep in mind as we read. Worship is what we're talking about. We may be talking about 70 here. We may be talking about these followers of Jesus, these disciples of Christ who have been sent on this mission. But ultimately, I want you to keep in mind, how does this relate to worship? And that's what we're going to be examining this morning. So first of all, let's begin with key number one, time in God's presence. That's a key. Like these 70 individuals, a prerequisite to worship or service is spending time with God. Can I get an amen? If you say you're a Christian and you do not spend time with God in prayer and studying His Word, I don't know. How can you be called a Christian and you don't want to have a relationship? How can I be married to my wife and say, I don't want a relationship with you, I just want to marry you? <laughs> Duh. Okay? It it's, it's does not make any sense. It, it really, kind of like an oxymoron, it, it, it can't be. It cannot be. So when we talk about having a key to worship, the, the main key is that we connect with God through personal, intimate relationship with Him. Like these 70 individuals, a prerequisite to worship or service is spending time with Him. And I'd like you to notice that spending time with God is sometimes hard. Hmm? Sometimes it's hard. Luke chapter 9, verse 54 and 55, in there it says, Lord, uh, do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? <laughs> you know, these disciples are realizing that as they hang out with Jesus, as they invoke the name of Jesus, the authority of Jesus Christ, the son of the living God, that, hey, things happen. And so here are people that, that are coming against them, and so their first thought is, hey, Lord, we've cast out demons, we've done other things, should we just call down fire on their heads? Uh, I would suggest that's not the Christian attitude, amen? 
Sometimes people do things to us, and, and our first inclination is, let's call down fire on their heads. Let's get back at them. Let's strike back. But you know, Jesus never did that, did he? He never struck back. He never struck out. He never lashed out. It is no different for us today. Sometimes in worship, God speaks harshly to us. He rebuked them. The Bible says Jesus rebuked his disciples, the followers of Jesus, the, one who were, the ones who were doing it right, the ones who he sent forth, uh, those who were following him and he was teaching them, and, and they were doing pretty good until this point, and he had to rebuke them. There's times when God rebukes us. He gets harsh with us when we really mess up, when he's trying to teach us something and lead our lives and we take it the wrong way. And what, what do you think has popped up right here? What do you see human nature right here? Pride. They're prideful, aren't they? They're thinking, wow, <laughs> look at me. I can cast out demons. Look at me. I can pray in Jesus' name. Look what happens. Look at me. Well, it's not about me. It's not about you. It's all about Say it with me, him, amen? That's it. We can confess it and, and um, our fellowship will be restored when we mess up or we can ignore it and often experience God's discipline in our lives. When we have sin in our life, whether it's pride or, or do I have to name all those things? Let me not name all those things. Let me just say when we have sin in our life, you know, we can either confess that sin and turn back to God, and get right with God, get our fellowship, listen to me, not our salvation, but my fellowship. If when I, when I mess up, you know what I've done? I've walked away from God. God says, listen, I'll forgive you, 1 John 1, 9, I'll forgive you, but you need to come back. You need to get back over here with me. And what happens is when we end up sinning, it's because we've stepped away from God. We may have put down our Bible and not had Bible study that day and maybe skipped church one time that week or done something else just because we didn't want to go. How many of you have ever said on Sunday morning, like this preacher has from time to time, getting up and saying, you know, I really don't feel like doing this? Huh? Okay. Yeah, there's some mornings when that alarm goes off 6 o'clock on Sunday morning and I'm thinking, gosh, I got to be at the church in two hours and I got to get up and I got and I go through my list of stuff I got to get done. I got to feed the dog, give the cat his shot, you know, do all this stuff, get all these things that you've got to do before you even get here. And you're thinking, I'd just rather not have to rush through and do all that. Wouldn't it be nice to just stay home and relax. I'll watch some preacher on TV. I mean, I'm not going to avoid God. I'll read my Bible a little. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, Paul wrote these words. He says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together as some have done, and I might add, for your convenience. Okay, I've said that. <clears throat> you know, there's, um, when Diane and I are on vacation, it's very unusual that we are someplace that we can't go to church. And even if, if we're someplace that, that there is no church, for instance, we've been on a cruise one time over a Sunday and there was no church service. Well, except that time half of y'all went with us on a cruise. That was many years ago. Half church went on the cruise. And uh, so we just all got together and we had church that morning in our room with everybody was piled in there. We did it short and, we didn't have a keyboard or anything, but, <clears throat> but sometimes you can't get to church. But we try to make it a point, even if we're not here, that we're there in God's house someplace with believers just giving God his praise and glory because he's due that. You say, well, I'm on vacation. I, I can skip a Sunday or two, you know, and I'm on vacation and God understands. Let me tell you what God understands. This is the Gospel of Stan. Here's what God understands. He is worthy of our attention, our sacrifice, our praise. He, he is worthy of all the adoration we can give him as often as we can give him that adoration and worship and praise and not just on Sunday. 
So if you're thinking, well, I'm on vacation for a couple of weeks. It'll be okay if I don't go to church. Well, you know, God ain't going to slap you with a lightning bolt or something. But let me tell you something. My heart is such that I want to be there. I want to find a church up in Tennessee someplace if I'm up there on vacation. I, I look for opportunities to get together. And I think it's, it's really interesting. It's kind of a privilege for me as a pastor to get to go to church somewhere else. Because you guys take vacation. You go here and you go there. And you may be out half a dozen times a year. I don't get to do that. It seems like you expect me to be here on a Sunday morning. Can I get an amen? Yeah. Wow. Got a lot of amens on that. Cancel that vacation we were going to take. I can't go. Um, but, you know, the desire of your heart is what we really need to consider. What do I desire? Do I desire? Some people desire right now to be here this morning, and there's no way they can be here. They're working, they're homebound, they're out of town, but the desire of their heart, God looks at the desire of your heart. Do not use that as an excuse and say, you know, God, I really desire to go to church this morning, but I've really been tired because we stayed out so late last night. Yeah, well, it was with other friends. They were Christian friends. And, and we were playing dominoes or, or we were visiting or, or whatever. But, you know, my question is, what God's question is, what's the desire of your heart? God looks on the inside. Amen. Genuine worship involves our time, time in God's presence. These 70 disciples had spent time with Jesus before he sent them out into a hostile world. Why would we think it not important to do the same? We go out to a hostile world every day when we walk out the door, don't we? Spending time with God is not only an action of worship, but it is a prerequisite for worship. Okay, time in God's presence, that's number one. Number two, the second key to worship can, can uh, never be experienced if we say, but first, but first let me go. That's what they said in chapter 9. One guy says, I'll follow you, but first let me go do this. The other guy says, well, I'll follow you, but I, I need to go do that. Well, you know, one guy says, let me go bury my father. And you think, well, that's a reasonable request. But according to Bible scholars, they look at this and they say, he wasn't talking about his father just died. He was talking about going home and hanging out at home until his father died. And the other guy, he, he's interesting. He says, just let me go say goodbye to my family. I heard someone say, and I've, I've heard this say, said more than once, but, and Diane and I have said this, you know, we have, we have family, we've got kids and grandkids, and we even got, I hate to say that almost, but we got some great grandkids. <laughs> <laughs> but in what I meant is all our kids are great. <laughs> okay, so, so when we talk about our family, you know, you know who our family is? You, you're a family. You are our family. God has encharged us to take care of you. Now, that doesn't mean that, um, you know, if, and if even a good neighbor, if, if you need a cup of sugar, you can go to a good neighbor and they'll give you a cup of sugar. But, um, but that doesn't mean that um, if you need my guitar to practice on, to begin playing the guitar, that I'm supposed to just give you my guitar. I really like my guitar. <laughs> but if you're a beginner, you're going to play and practice. You're not going to do it on my guitar. Amen? Doug, are they going to do it on your guitar? No, we got other guitars we will loan you to practice on. Okay, yeah. But if Jesus says, give up that guitar, it's gone. It is gone. What's in your life that would be hard for you to let go of if Jesus said to give it up? It's called sacrifice. Think about that. Well, these 70 spent time with Jesus, and now we come to the point of looking at chapter 9. we got to count the cost of discipleship. There is a cost 
to follow in Jesus. You say, well, I thought the Bible said that if I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, I'll be saved and it'll influence my whole household. <clears throat> and that's true. It's by faith we're saved, right? By grace through faith, rather. And so when we look at saying, I got to count the cost. Well, what cost is there? Let me, let me tell you in a nutshell, here's the cost of following Jesus. All, everything, your life, that's it. The whole shebang. Everything belongs to Christ because Christ has given you everything. He's given you eternal life. And so we, we got to count the cost. Chapter 9 gives us a great insight into the cost of following Jesus. But it also helps us understand the key aspect in worship is, listen to me, Jesus first. Jesus first. Boy, you think, well, that's simple. Well, there's two conjunctions in the English language uh, that can destroy the saving power of the gospel. The first conjunction is and, and the second conjunction is but. Two conjunctions. You think, well, how does that apply? Some people want to say to be saved from the penalty of our sin, we've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you just crossed the line. We've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and do this, go to church. <clears throat> I gotta, if you're going to go to heaven, you've got to believe in Jesus and you've got to go to church. Well, how many times I go? And normally they say every time doors open. That's ridiculous. Going to church has nothing to do with salvation, except that the reason you want to go to church is because of your salvation. Amen? So two conjunctions. Jesus spoke uh, to others who said, and he said, follow me. And their response was, okay, Lord, but let me go do this first. But let me do that first. You know, we get people in the church today that God's speaking to to do something and they say, well, I'll, I'll do it, but not right now. <laughs> Others say, well, well uh, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I also believe that you've got to tithe. I also believe that you've got to sing in the choir, or you've got to serve, or you've got to, got to, got to, got to, and. It's the and conjunction. There is no and conjunction in salvation. Jesus did it all. He paid it all. All as we have to do is believe it and we will receive him and all that he has speaking of salvation. So you better believe there's a cost to following Jesus. We know the Bible says in Acts 16, 31, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, you'll be saved. You and your household. And in Romans 10, 9, if you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. <clears throat> Let me tell you something about this word, believe. In John's gospel, in the original language, you can look at that word and you can see that it's interchangeable in John's gospel with the word faith. So believing is faithing, faith. Faith is what, according to Hebrews, faith's what pleases God. It's when we faith, when we believe. That means we don't necessarily have all the answers to all the questions in the Bible. We don't necessarily have all the answers of, of what God wants us to do with our lives, but we believe that God wants to control or have control of our lives. And if you faith God, let me tell you what, when you come down an aisle and you shake a preacher's hand and say, I want to be saved, I, I want to give my life to Jesus, do you really mean it? Do you really mean you want to give your life over to Jesus? Because if you don't, you're just doing lip service. And there is no spiritual change, no eternal life, nothing's different. Except people may put you on their church roll because you came down the aisle. But the truth of the matter is, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ means to have a change of attitude about sin in your life, about sin in general. It means that the things that I, I used to do, you know... I don't feel like I want to do those anymore. Uh, the things that, that I want to do still, but I know that's not what Jesus wants me to do. i got to draw a line in the sand there and say I am different now because Christ has done a work in my life. What has he done? Let me tell you something. When you, when you, whether you come down an aisle or not, when you give your life to Jesus Christ by faith and it's real, he gives you 
His Holy Spirit. 100%. It's not, it's not I'll dabble it out to you and see how good you are. No. He gives you His total self in your life to guide and direct you, to inspire you, to strengthen you, to empower you. What do you need all that for? Because it costs something to be a disciple, and it's sometimes very hard to be a disciple. It doesn't mean that it's, it's hard to follow the teachings of Jesus. No, I can read about them, I can study about them, I can go to Bible classes, but the hard part is to walk it, to live it. In where, not in church, oh, it's easy to be a Christian in church. Man, I ain't heard no cussing in here. I ain't heard no shouting or anybody mad. I ain't heard nothing. It's easy to be a Christian in church. But we worship here, but we live out there. And what you believe, if it's real, it's going out there with you. It will be out there with you if it's real. And if you don't see any difference in the way your life was before you said, I became a Christian, the way it is now, you need to back up and do a spiritual checkup. What does it take? It takes faith. Well, all I got to do is confess the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in my heart. God, believe it. Oh, hold up. Believe in my heart. Faith in my heart. In other words, the center of my being, my total being, believes that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, died for my sins, rose again on the third day, sits at the right hand of the Father, make an intercession of the, for the saints, and one day, he's coming back. He is coming back, not to be born in a manger, but riding on a white stallion with the saints of God behind him. I like that picture. I got a parenthetical thought here, but I like that picture with Jesus charging towards the earth and all the saints of God following him. <clears throat> you notice who's got a sword? Jesus. Because we are not involved in the battle. He takes care of it. We're just there as spectators to watch this happen take place and ultimately the coronation of the king jesus for ushering in the millennial reign of christ and all eternity and oh man you know i think about what i go through in this world sometimes anybody had a hard week maybe not last week you've had a hard week you've had difficult things pop up in your life and you have to deal with those things on a daily basis and you have to deal with relationships and family members getting upset with you or a friend getting upset or maybe a church member getting upset with you. All these things you got to deal with. Listen, one day God's going to take care of all that. He is going to restore literally the Garden of Eden back the way it was and we're going to live the way he designed us to live. It is wonderful. Peter tells us, he makes it clear so we don't just have head knowledge about Jesus, that he's a real person. But Peter tells us it's our faith in God's grace that saves us. Then salvation produces those good works. Salvation, Peter said this, he said works, faith without works is dead. In other words, it's not that you have to do works to be saved. He's saying if you truly got saved, the natural outflow of your life is fruit of the Spirit, which is good works. <clears throat> according to Romans 12.1, you know that verse, to experience God in worship and in our lives, we must become living sacrifices for Christ. A third key that I want to share with you this morning is trusting and obeying. Time with God and putting Him first before everything leads us to trust Him and to obey Him. He said or he gave the 70 specific instructions on where to go and what to do as they stepped out in faith. Now here's Jesus. They're real comfortable right there with Jesus. But then he says, I want you to go. You're going to separate yourself from me in a physical way. And I want you to go into these towns and I want you to be the herald. I want you to be that megaphone and let people know that the kingdom of God is at hand or near. And they chose to respond, and they fulfilled their destiny. They were just like us. They were ordinary people, and they were following Jesus. Because of that, they were destined 
to walk in full revelation of God's grace and power. Let me tell you what it means to be a disciple of Jesus. You do the sayings of Jesus. You do. You don't just learn them. You do them. Amen? To be a follower of Jesus or a disciple, you study what Jesus says to do. You look at it. You figure out, how is this going to apply to me? How can this work in my life? And the Holy Spirit of the living God who lives in you because you have faith, Tim, will direct your life. And if you want Him to, He will lead you into all truth. So we're destined to be transformed into His image, and we're destined to spend eternity with the one who loves us with an everlasting love. God uses us when we trust and obey Him. Anything else is is not acceptable as a disciple of Christ. It's not acceptable to say I'm a Christian, but I'm doing my own thing. There is no, no your own thing. Did you get that out right? There is no your own thing if you're a Christian because you have surrendered your life to Christ because, not to get, but because He has given you eternal life because of the faith that you express. When we trust him to take care of things that we'll face tomorrow, we'll walk in faith and God is pleased with us. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 speaks of our mighty God and his concern for us. Listen to what it says. It's on the screen. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, and how does he do it? According to his power that is at work in us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Can I get a hallelujah? Let me tell you, when I look at the book of Ephesians and I read what Paul wrote there, according to his power that is at work in us, God at work in you, that does not mean that you... After you got saved and now you're a Christian, and okay, I'll do the Christian thing. I'll come to church every Sunday. That is not what we're talking about. We're talking about being a person who has Christ living in them by the way of the Holy Spirit, and all God's power is available and in you, working within you. Do you understand what that means? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Amen? That means that whatever God says I want you to do, we know we can do it because we're not doing it in our power. Here's an acid test for you. If you're wondering, well, did God tell me to do that? You know, I hear people say, well, God told me that that I ought to go help so-and-so. Well, okay, go help so-and-so. Um, The Bible tells us all through there that we're supposed to help people, so I don't need a direct voice of God to tell me to go help somebody. He's already told me. But here's here's a good acid test. When God tells you to do something that you know, there ain't no way I can do this, you know it's God. Because God wants to work through you, not to show you off, but to show himself off, amen? To bring himself glory throughout all generations. That's his goal. The old hymn says it well when it says, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, amen? So what's the bottom line in worship? Well, let me put it this way. It's real simple. (laughs) Tammy started out that great name of Jesus. And if we want to know what it's all about in worship, it's all about him, That's what we come here for. We don't come here for people to see our clothes or drive our new car up and and we want everybody to see our new car. That's not why we're here. We're here because we humbly come in together as the body of Christ and we say, Lord God, here is your body. Here we are. We have come to worship you because you're worthy to be worshiped. We have come into Bible study at 930 to study about you and what you've done with people in the past and what pleases you and what displeases you. We have come because everything that we're doing here is all about you. 
It's never about us, although we're not just spectators of worship. We are participants. Worship is exclusively God-focused. Thanksgiving, adoration, sacrifice, exaltation, blessings, and proclamation of his great name are all components of ministering to the Lord. You know, the Bible speaks about that. You know, we have ministry, right? We ministry to the homeless, and we minister to these and those, and teachers and other people. And, but you know, the Bible talks about a ministry unto the Lord. We read about that in the Old Testament for sure, where the priests would, as they went in and did their sacrifices, they were ministering unto the Lord. And when we come in here and we sing these songs, someone told me <clears throat> years ago, we would sing a song and then everybody would sit down and then we'd have something else and, and then we'd stand up and sing a song again and we'd sit down and and someone said, you know, all we do is we stand up and sit down, stand up and sit down. I said, we're trying to keep you awake. So we compromise. Now you'll notice that we stand up and we sing a couple of songs and we let you sit down and rest a little bit. But before you can go to sleep, we stand you up again and we're going to sing some more. Amen. There is a strategy in worship. But the idea and the motivation is that we have come into this place to meet God. We have come here in his presence. And if you're just coming in for a worship service because this is what you're supposed to do, and then when it's over, you're glad it's over because you're awful hungry. How many of you all hungry? No, don't answer that. <clears throat> I'm not going to ask that. Does he need our ministry to be God? Of course not. But worship has a circular design where we bless the Lord with our worship and he blesses us in return. You all ever notice that? I mean, how many times have you thought, man, I am just blessed to have been in that service today, you know? Yeah, because we offer blessing unto the Lord, ministry unto the Lord, and he reciprocates that. He blesses us. Look at Exodus 23, 25, where it states such, worship the Lord your God and his blessing will be on your food and water. I will take away sickness from among you. <clears throat> now, you know, you can pray this. If you're sick, you can pray this to the Lord. And I'm sure he's going to listen to that. He's going to consider it. But I don't want you to just think that if I'll come and worship, then God will, he, I won't get sick. I won't get cancer. I won't get the flu. I'm telling you, this is a generic thing that God is saying. So let's don't take it out of context or just take this one verse. We need to read what's before it. We need to read it, what's after it. We need to understand what context this verse is given. But ultimately, I want you to see the fact that the Lord says, the Lord says that his blessing will be on your food. In other words, God is going to bless your life as you worship him. It's a promise. I want to be careful here that we don't understand, uh, but this is a promise for Israel. However, we can certainly expect God to bless us since he has promised us to give us all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Well, if he's going to do that, you know he's going to take care of your needs here. Amen. That's a piece of cake. We don't worship to receive blessing, but blessings are built into our worship because God's desire is to bless those who worship him in what? In spirit and in truth. The right motives, the right ways. Our worship should never focus on what we get out of worship, but strictly on the character and the nature of God himself. It's all about him, and it ain't about anything else. Amen? It's certainly not about us. We are privileged to be here this morning to come together as a body of Christ and to worship him. You know, there's a high school marching band has the term they use in the final moments of their halftime performance. How many of you ever been in a high school marching band? Oh, look at the hands, cool, all right. You may know this. Uh, in the final moments of the halftime performance, they call it blowing to the box. <laughs> I had never heard that term before. Of course, I was very distant from marching band in high school. After their final song concludes, they turned the and faced the bleachers full of fans 
And this is a moment the band director has instructed them, when you turn to the onlooking fans, you are to blow your instruments with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, no matter what instrument you play, you are to play, you give it your very best performance at that moment, on, it's all on the line, lift your head, play louder, it's time to let them hear all that you have to give. Sound like worship? It is. As worshipers, the message is clear. When we turn our attention to the one who we are worshiping, who is worthy of our worship, as an expression and experience, it's totally dependent on where we are focused. If he's in the press box judging our performance in our lives to see if we measure up, then we'll approach him with caution and with fear. But if we see him as our heavenly father who has climbed to the very top of the bleachers up there to get a be the best view he can have of his child down here and he's up there waving so you can see him from the field and he's shouting his support, then nothing that no one can keep us from experiencing God at that moment. That's what worship should be like when we come in to worship God. I want you to picture him up there watching you at the top of the bleachers, just rooting for you as you're giving, well, I hate to use the word, best performance, your best act of worship. In other words, it's coming from the heart with all your heart, your soul, and your strength. You're worshiping him because he is worthy. Let me close with this scripture. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, Plans, listen, plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Our God is worthy of our worship. Amen.